Hey everyone, Chat Cemetery is back with our second episode. Today we are talking all about Salem's Lot, the book, which came out October 17th, 1975. So this one is pretty old. It came out about a year and a half after Carrie did. So, you know, we're still in the very, very early stages here. We have a lot to get through. And today my guest is Andy Maroon. Andy, how are you doing? I'm doing good. Thank you for uh, having me on. Of course. And since it is your first time on the podcast, why don't you go ahead and tell everyone a little bit about yourself before we dive on into the conversation? Yeah, uh, I'm uh, pretty new to Stephen King as a whole. I've only started uh, diving into him over the last, I guess, year or so. It really started. I started with the books right after seeing the It movie. I had seen a bunch of other Stephen King movies, but after the It movie, I was like, oh, there's got to be more stuff behind everything here so I went and read it and I I liked it a lot so then I went and read The Shining because I you know The Shining is one of my favorite movies and then I had started reading this one because my my friend Thomas had mentioned that it was one that he liked so that was sort of my path to get me to Salem's Lot but yeah in in terms of the Salem's Lot or the Stephen King novels I'm only three in or so over the last year yeah, it's one of those things where you sort of just have to pick a spot and start because I can't remember when I first read one of his books, but my mom had been collecting them back when they were first coming out in the mass market paperback sizes and everything like that. So she had quite a few of his books for a while, and I sort of just picked out a few books here and there, but then some part of me just wanted to go back and start going through everything chronologically. Right. And thankfully, I had the idea for this podcast not too long after doing that. So, you know, I think I've read about <laughs> his first 10 books in order. I did skip Cujo to get to different seasons for my podcast, Welcome to Geekdom, where I talked about the Shawshank Redemption. But okay. Cujo is the only one of those first 10 or so, I would say, that I have skipped so far. And that's on my list to go through next here. So it's one of those things where you can either go in chronological order and by chronological order, I'm talking about by release date, because if we go by when he wrote said books, that gets a little messy. So it's just one of those things where I was like, okay, I'm going to start from the beginning. I had known about Carrie because of the movie and, you know, Sissy Spacek made that film so popular But then I was getting into some of the earlier books like Salem's Lot and Night Shift, and I didn't know quite as much about those. So I didn't even know that Salem's Lot was a vampire story when I started it. So, you know, I think part of me was taken by surprise with that. I was like, oh, so that's kind of what this is about, because it's one of those things where I was always familiar with the title just from hearing it because there have been three or four different adaptations of it. So over the years, it's just like, oh, yeah, that's a Stephen King thing. But I didn't quite know what it was about. Did you go into this one knowing that it was a vampire story? No, I went in totally blind to this. This was just one that I was sort of recommended. And I was like, sure, you know, I'll give this one a shot. And I actually, I think I read the 2004, like, re-release of it that had a bunch of extra stuff with it. Okay. So I didn't know anything about the book, you know, at all. And the first, like, couple pages is, like, an introduction by Stephen King. And he's talking about, you know, how all these other old vampire things sort of inspired him to write this. And I was like, oh, I guess this is a vampire book then. So (laughs) it would have been much more interesting to sort of see that build up without knowing what was coming. But Stephen King sort of spoiled it himself, I guess, in that intro one. Um, But, yeah, I, I didn't have a clue at all. Yeah, so we're going to just go on and jump right into how the story was paced, because this has sort of alternating chapters. You have chapters that are focused more so on the city and then ones that focus on the characters specifically. And it's one of those things where the place matters a lot in quite a few of Stephen King's stories. You know, we have the recently released Castle Rock show that's all about that city. And then you have Derry, Maine, where we see it and everything like that take place. And there's just something about certain cities that Stephen King writes about that are just so interesting. It's like the town itself is a character. And I sort of really feel that way with this book in particular. Yeah, I I would definitely agree. You know, 
th- there were those full chapters that were basically dedicated to the lot and the the people living there and they were something that you know I re- I didn't didn't take me too long to read this but there was one day that I was reading it and I was just like oh my gosh I don't want to read about these people anymore I just want to get back to the story and then there was another time where I was just so, like the the lot chapters really sucked me in with you know describing just the town as a whole going into the detail on like you know the million little side characters that he has going on in there and it was very different depending on my mood whether I was really drawn into him or not but overall it was something that I I really enjoyed and uh having only a little bit of experience with King as a whole like I had a lot of I saw a lot of similarities in it where in it it would it went back and talked about you know stuff that had happened in the past right that you know was sort of impacted the story a little farther in the future just gave a bunch of uh history to make this town sort of this living breathing thing and i think that these lot chapters really did that re- did that really really well and i i actually think it was it's one of my favorite parts of this book even though some some of the days i didn't want to read it but yeah <laughs> I think they, they added so much to it like it it really does it 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 brings it to life it's like if uh you're playing a video game and you know there's a difference between a game that has a living breathing world and a game that's just there to facilitate this character going from one point to another like it really does make a huge difference and i i I think uh he did a really good job with that i felt a little similarly to you in regards to sort of not wanting to read about certain aspects at different times in the book because for me This book started off really slow, and I don't know if that's just because I didn't know anything about it going into it, really. And I was like, okay, this guy's here. He wants to write a book, and I'm not really sure what any of this is leading up to. And then you get the vampire bit, and you're like, oh, okay. So I feel like, you know, it took me a while to get into the book, but then once it clicked, I was like, okay, you know this sort of finished off better than I was anticipating. And for whatever reason, it's commonly talked about that Stephen King doesn't necessarily finish books all that well sometimes. And that's something that obviously will vary from person to person, whether or not they like the ending in general. But I think with this one, for me, it was more the beginning where I was like, okay, not really sure about this. And then it slowly started getting better. And, you know, I somewhat recently read this but since you read it much more recently than I did you'll probably have more details fresh in your mind than I will but it just really felt like at the beginning I was like okay why do I want to care about this main character in Ben Mears and I guess we can sort of transition to talking about his role in the book yeah to go a little bit on sort of the it's starting out a little bit slow um I'm a big horror movie buff and my favorite thing are the horror movies that are like have a real slow burn and it's mm-hmm. like you know the first hour of the movie in itself might not be all that enjoyable but the payoff at the end is worth sort of sitting through that you know exposition and and, and learning about everything and that's that's really what I how I felt about that book was it definitely drags on for the first half but it makes the second half of the book just so much more enjoyable. It's like you get very comfortable because not a lot of stuff is happening and you just get those little drips of like, you know, uh, the dog that was hung up on the post. Like you just get these little drips of creepy, awkward stuff. Right. And it's just that slow burn. And I think that really paid off in the end. But if you were like, hey, you know, Stephen King's a great writer and you should definitely read this, those first like, you know 200 pages you're like what am i reading like what is the (laughs) where's the payoff here and so i totally can see how somebody wouldn't like that but i think it was was definitely worth it and yeah like you were saying you know ben sort of shows up and he's kind of like this i mean i'm assuming he was sort of like a placeholder for king himself he's this you know writer who's sort of this hunky dude who just runs into the girl and she's like immediately in love with him sort of thing it's it sort of takes a little bit for him to kind of turn into... And I mean, I didn't really ever get to the point where I was super interested in him. He was actually one of my least favorite characters. Mm-hmm. But it did take a while. I mean, not only just him, but any anybody to care about anything. It's just, I guess, you know, 
how he sort of attacked it, sort of that slow burn. But yeah, I don't know. Ben Mears in himself was just, he was a little too vanilla for me. Right. It's like he did exactly what you would expect kind of like a 15-year-old kid who wanted to be the hero guy to do. It's like there was no real... And I, I don't have enough experience with King to know whether this is common or not with him, but like there was no real sort of gray area. It seemed very straightforward. It's like at any moment you could pinpoint exactly what he was going to do because it's what the hero would normally do sort of thing. And it, it, that was just a little a little bland for me. But it's, yeah... <laughs> I know what you mean. It's one of those things where I don't think Ben really spent enough time in this town to have that sort of deeper connection that a lot of the current residents have, you know. Oh, yeah, he definitely is sort of an outsider. Yeah, when he comes to town, you can sort of feel everyone's eyes on him, in a sense. And it's the same with the guys who come and buy the antique shop and or open the antique shop and everything like that. And we'll obviously get into them a little more later. But with Ben, it was like, you know, they could tell he was just there to do this one thing and sort of get on with his life somewhere else. He was there, I believe, for four years or so when he was a kid. And it's one of those things where you're like, okay, he was there when he was, what, five years old and stayed until he was nine. And, you know, how much of an impact could that really have on him? Sure, those are some years of your life where you're really impressionable and everything. And obviously, it's the Marston house that draws him back because he did have a bad experience there. But other than that one bad experience, you're like, okay, what else is there to the story? And at times, it's like, oh, Nothing, really. You know, it's kind of this house, and then he finds out there's vampires, and that's sort of his story with the town. <laughs> right. Even going into the house, the house was something that drew me in, sort of, I guess, sort of like it, how it drew Ben in. It was right. you know, his his thing to get him back in into the lot, but the house to me was something that I thought was extremely interesting at the beginning of the book, and I actually was a little dis disappointed that the house itself wasn't kind of more of a you know, more of a, a character. It seemed throughout the whole book that it was like, you know, this looming presence that was just sort of like, you know, waiting and almost kind of this manifestation of evil sort of thing. And it kind of felt like, I don't think it necessarily fell flat, but it was more of like a bit of sort of a red herring thing where I thought the house was going to have more of a central role kind of thing but I'm also a sucker for like haunted houses and stuff like that so that was sort of wishful thinking and wanting that to kind of be more of a player in the story as a whole because it did throughout the whole story I felt like it kind of was just this beacon you know he referenced it time and time again whether it was characters act like you know actually pointing it out or you know laying a scene and then at the end of the scene it goes you know and the Marston house you know and from the window you could see the Marston house or something like that it was sort of this unspoken thing with the residents and everything. You know, it was this big house on the hill, basically, like you said, a haunted house. And everyone seemed to just really stay away from it, except for when the men move into it. And it's Kurt Barlow who buys it. And he's not from the area. He's Austrian, I believe. And, you know, he has this outsider presence like Ben does, but even more so because he's literally not even from the area. So with him, it's like, okay, why is this guy buying that house? And then you have his business partner, Richard Straker, who is the one who goes out and is sort of the public face of the antique shop and everything like that. So you have this mystery with the character who buys the house as well. And it's just one of those things like, okay, why aren't we seeing more of the house at this point? And like you said, it's something that should have felt like a character much in the way that the town itself did, but it doesn't quite get there. And it's a little disappointing, but at the same time, you're like, okay, well, the town is interesting enough in it and of itself to carry, continue to carry the story in a way that the house wasn't able to. Right. I, I, I totally agree. I, I think if the 
ta- if you didn't get those lot chapters, it would make make the house not becoming sort of a character in its own much more disappointing. But I, I, I think you nailed it with with the town sort of being the other character, the house. I you know, I think it worked, but I just was, you know, hoping that it was the house had a little more of a little more of a role. Speaking of the town too, one of the things I want to make note of is that, you know, with Stephen King, certain characters and towns will recur in books later down the line. And that happens in a sense with Jerusalem's Lot, because you have these two short stories later where we see the town and one is literally called Jerusalem's Lot. So he's not hiding it. It's not like some little Easter egg in another story. The entire story is literally about this. And, you know, that's something I'll be talking about in another episode with the book that that story appears in. But this town has enough of a significance for him to want to revisit it. And I think we really get an understanding of why that is in this book, because like you said, Ben isn't the most interesting character in this book by a long shot. He just happens to be the reason we're talking about this town. He's returned. And that's sort of how the story about this town starts. That's sort of our point where we're like, okay, now we want to know more about the town instead of knowing more about Ben. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing either. You know, sometimes you can have a main character who maybe isn't as great as some of the other characters and the book can still be fine by the end of it. And that's certainly how I felt with this one. You know, the town gives you enough and all of the supporting characters as well to where you're like, okay, it doesn't really matter in the end that Ben wasn't exactly what we wanted him to be necessarily. Right. I definitely agree. And again, with my limited experience to King, it it, it seems like his side characters definitely like, have more of an impact than a lot of normal side characters do it's like so the side characters were more interesting in this by far like i i just think he does such a good job like i will i won't remember the name of most of the characters because there were so many of them and most of them you know well none of them were like extremely well fleshed out they were all interesting enough to where when they popped up you know in the book you weren't like ugh, i gotta deal with with this guy again sort of thing. Yeah, why don't we go ahead and talk about some of the supporting characters just because there are quite a few worth mentioning and then we'll get into some of our favorite moments from the book. But I know a couple of the big characters as far as the supporting ones go are Father Callahan and Mark Petrie. And these two characters are intensely different, (laughs) to put it mildly. And you have, you know... Father Callahan as this figurehead for the town, but you have all of these things happening that aren't very religious-like, I guess you could say. So you have this contrast between his character and what's actually going on in the story that makes him a little more interesting, I think. Right. And even him on his own wasn't necessarily the most interesting character at the beginning. I think his story throughout the book got better and better and especially like the way he his storyline at least in this book kind of ends I think was the most interesting but you know he he definitely started out I thought they were going to go down one path with him and sort of explore this you know his like it seemed like kind of a bit of a wavering faith sort of thing and I thought it would kind of come back around to be this whole big you know uproarious thing with him refining his faith and conquering the vampires or whatever and it didn't really seem like that was the path that it you know it it didn't work out that way but especially by the end like if i remember correctly barlow like cuts himself or does something to force him to force father callahan to drink his blood is that right that sounds correct yeah it was it was something like that because like he started that slow process of turning into a vampire changing in some regard and i like he recognized it he tried to go back into the church and when he touched the church like his hands burned and the door handles exploded or something like that so he just got on a bus and left and like that was the end of what you got from him right in that book yeah. and to me like the i finished the book and i was like what the heck happened here so i had to go look it up and that was the first little bit that i got where he sort of 
reaches into all these other Stephen King books and that, you know, Stephen King's shared universe is significantly bigger than I thought. I thought it was more of like, oh, you know, there's Salem's Lot, but it's also near this, you know, fake town of Derry, Maine. And like, I didn't realize how interconnected his sort of shared universe thing went. So that was trying to figure out what happened to Father Callahan was my first sort of intro into all that and it just opened up all these doors and I'm like I was like oh. <laughs> it's a little overwhelming with all that stuff but I feel like I kind of need to read a little bit more about Father Callahan in the you know books that he shows up in just because the end of his storyline was so much more interesting you know than a lot of the stuff and I'm I'm fine with his storyline in Salem's Lot kind of feeling unfulf- unfulfilled right I think that lends itself i i don't always like when things wrap up too neatly neatly and nicely it's like i liked that that was very gray and if he didn't show up in any other book that still would have been a like an extremely interesting and kind of cool ending for that character i thought having him leave definitely gives you a lot of options because he gets on that bus and we don't really know what's going to happen next with him it's like okay so Stephen King can obviously stash that character away and bring him back at a different time, which obviously that's something he does. If you make the rounds with the Stephen King wiki pages, you can right. <laughs> really, really get into this deep rabbit hole of, okay, this character was in this, and then they went and appeared in this. And even if it's just a small role you're like this means something it has to he wouldn't have done this if it didn't mean something and you can really just sort of dive into quite a few different characters who sort of have that common theme of appearing in other books or short stories down the line and with father callahan it's like okay you can tell this guy is struggling with what's going on in this town but He's not struggling with it enough to necessarily want to be the one to fix it. He just leaves. Right. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. And that that's a contrast to the character we have in Mark Petrie, because he's the complete opposite. He's like, I am going to end this. And he's a kid. So it's one of those things where obviously he is not the first kid that Stephen King has written about Carrie took place in high school and everything like that. So he sort of has this knack for writing about these kids who sort of just take things into their own hands. And we see that with Mark in this book and he goes up to the house. He's not afraid of, you know, whatever unspoken rule there is about not going up to the house or anything like that. But when he does so, it comes at the cost of Susan. So, you know, he's brash. And because of that brashness, there's this big consequence to it. But it doesn't really stop him from continuing to try. Right. And I mean, I think Mark was the first person to just be fully on board with the fact that there are vampires. Like, I think it took everybody else, you know, anywhere from a couple pages to never recognizing it. But he was the first one that was like, oh, yeah, you know, These are vampires, and this is how you basically fight them. Like, it's like normally in the, I feel like in that situation, it's normally an older, sort of like wise guy who's like, oh, yes, you know, these are the problems, and here's how you fight them. And in this book, it's just Mark, you know, this young kid who's building all his monster models and stuff. He's like, oh, yeah, obviously they're vampires, and this is how you fight vampires, and this is what we need to do. I need to go up to the house with a steak and, you know, garlic and what, do whatnot, and, take care of the vampires and then you know he was unafraid and immediately knew sort of what he needed to do um and it was a little like it the teacher's name was mike i think yeah i believe so like that character i thought was going to be really interesting and then it just turned into this oh it's matt sorry there is a mike yes but there's a matt there's a lot of names in this one in passing so matt burke is the high school teacher and mike ryerson was one of the infected locals oh right because they have a they have a interaction at some point but yeah matt's character i thought was sort of gonna be what mark ended up being sort of the and he he is to an extent but he kind of turns into this like you know stationary talking encyclopedia at some point and his whole character arc i just thought was kind of weird and underwhelming like i thought 
he would have a bigger role, but he just kind of like gets stuck in bed and then doesn't ever leave again. Yeah. It's just very weird. And like, I definitely like that. I'm much more of the mindset where I'd rather have something unexpected happen, even if it's underwhelming, than have something expected happen. So all in all, I'm actually okay with it. I just was, you know, reading forward, I had this feeling that something else was going to happen with him, which was a little disappointing. But yeah, Mark, you know, I've... I'm three Stephen King books in, and each one has had kids be these, like, big major players. So I'm assuming this is a common theme theme among his, is that the kids are kind of these badass kids who get shit done kind of thing. I think it helps because in the kids' minds, it's just a simple solution. You know, we see Mark go up there and be like, okay, this is what we need to do, so let's just go do it. He doesn't question anything else surrounding those choices so it's one of those things where i think that's something that is definitely more common with kids they're not going to overthink every little thing and that's partially what keeps him alive by the end of this it's just him and ben and you're like oh okay that makes sense in a way (laughs) right i think ben's best character development i thought was him accepting that the vampires were a thing I thought that was one of the points where, you know, his character got to kind of grow up a little bit in a way that was interesting. And then the doctor, uh, what was the doctor's name? Jimmy Cody, I believe. Yes. That was one where I think it was him and Ben were sitting around talking about what was going on. And the doctor was like very scientific about everything. Right. But then... Ben is laying out all of the information. He was like, yeah, none of it makes sense. And he's like, well, this is kind of what happened. And the doctor is already like, you know, I guess we have to go exhume the body and and figure out what's going on. I I think him coming around to the fact that the vampires could have potentially been a thing was something that you don't normally get from a character like that. The, this sort of scientific, like, you know, there has to be a rational explanation for this yeah. sort of thing. <laughs> it was refreshing to see him sort of come around and be like, yeah, none of this makes sense. So let's go figure out, you know, what the heck's going on. Absolutely. Are there any other of the supporting characters that you want to discuss before we move on to our favorite moments? I'm not going to remember his name. Oh, Dud? The like kind of creepy dude that lived in the dump? I think his name was Dud something. And I don't necessarily like this character, but I think this character is really interesting. Just, you know, from top to bottom, his whole little sections in, like, the lot chapters, like, he's just this gross kind of weird hunchback guy who, like, shoots rats in the dump. I don't know. The way King described that whole thing and, like, the little shack that he lives in was just... It was very intrigue like it really sucked me in and then he had like the crush on the the high school girl or the middle school girl or whatever and then barlow finds him in the dump and he's like yeah you know i can get you all these things that you want and he's just real i think he was one of the first people to be turned when everything sort of starts going off yeah i'm blanking on names and everything here oh yeah there's there's so many of them yeah because you get a lot of people who are mentioned in passing too and obviously ben has to find a place to stay and there are people there and it's sort of this thing where if you aren't paying super close attention you can probably forget someone's name within a few pages at least that's how it felt for me (laughs) yeah absolutely I, i i totally agree it's i feel kind of the same way when i was reading game of thrones it's like there are so many names and so many like people going on that I'm just trying to follow, like, (laughs) the main points here. I'll figure out who everybody is sort of as it goes. But I definitely, like, I mean, and I I think that was one of the things that made the town feel so alive is there were so many people and you got so much of each person. But it was definitely overwhelming, you know, trying to remember who did what, especially when they all have, you know, Mark, Mike, Matt. Yeah. (laughs) Some of those names are so similar, like... (laughs) They definitely got jumbled a bit. Absolutely. And for favorite moments here, we've 
touched on one of mine a little already and that's when mark goes up to the house and is like all right here's what we're doing we're gonna do it but then susan ends up being turned into a vampire and i think that does give him some perspective on okay hey maybe this isn't as easy as i thought it was going to be but that doesn't mean we're going to stop trying no definitely and i definitely liked the susan turning right because that felt very like that was very out of left field like i feel like that just doesn't often happen and i really enjoy when stuff like that happens plus she wasn't all that interesting of a character and it fleshed ben out a bit more it gave him a reason to care and to stay otherwise you know if you're ben and you don't care about susan and all this stuff starts happening you just kind of nope out of there and you know you have no real reason to stay and you know at least having her turn gives him a motivation that we can understand and follow a little a little bit more but i i definitely really like that part too especially because there was like a little cliffhanger at the end of one chapter where she was sneaking around in the grass and then she felt somebody's hand on her shoulder or something like that and then the chapter ends and you're like oh gosh you know is this did something get her and it turns (laughs) out it's just mark being like hey let's make sure we do about this the right way you know sort of thing and so you're like relieved and then you know 20 pages later or so she's she's gone and she's turned it's one of those cliffhangers where it doesn't end up being a bad thing, but you still have all of those thoughts going through your head for that moment. And you're like, oh, OK, let, let's play out all these different scenarios. And then you find out that it's like the best possible scenario, pretty much. Right. And I feel like he did that a couple of times in that book. And it was definitely very strategic because, like you said, you, you you were still wearing all those emotions when you found out that it was just Mark. But it's like, you know, you went from zero to a hundred and you don't just go back to zero again you kind of got right. <laughs> let it wear off so it, it adds this extra like layer of tension to that whole next scene that even in itself was already tense enough like it didn't need it but he already got you kind of like startled you into that frame of mind so you were already like more tense going into that next scene you were already on edge which that I have to relate everything back to the horror movies because that's where my experience is. But, like, he got you uncomfortable and then he puts you into another uncomfortable situation. So you just, it was, he like doubled up on it. Right. And I know we haven't talked about Mike Ryerson a whole lot, but some of your favorite moments actually involve this character. So why don't we go ahead and dive into some of those? Because, like I mentioned, he's one of the first ones to turn so we have this character who is experiencing this right as it's starting and he has a decent storyline in this too as one of the supporting characters right Uh, i think one of the most stressful scenes in the whole book was when he was trying to bury danny glick and it's like he didn't know what was wrong but he just knew something was wrong. Right. And I think it was only like three or four pages, but it was just this process of him trying to, you know, getting ready to bury the body and being uncomfortable and like being aware that the sun was setting. And that was something else that he did a lot through the book before he like made it very clear that there were vampires. He talked about the sun a lot. I remember, and this was one of, like, it really highlighted it, where he, I think it was, you know, he was just trying to get it done before nightfall, and he just kept talking about the sun going down, and there was just sort of this impending doom sort of feeling of of what was to come, and it was just, there was, like, a couple pages that it just made me uncomfortable, and I think he, like, I think he passed out and then woke back up and tried to finish the grave when it was already dark, and he was, like, real uncomfortable and he did that I, he had gotten bit at that point but didn't didn't realize and then he went to the bar and just looked like you know looks like death and that's where uh matt found him and then their whole spiel happened right and danny is the one who infects him too so by then you kind of know this is already happening for mike you're like okay you know he's going to be a vampire he was burying this kid and was in such close proximity to him it's like okay how does he not get infected 
Yeah, I think if I remember correctly, he like had this crazy urge to open the casket, and that's sort of how that all, whole thing starts. Because I think they had it locked, or did am I mis? I might be misremembering that, but I I think he might he either had an urge and actually opened it, or he just had the like urge to, and then didn't actually go through with it. But yeah, the Danny getting him. So I think early on it was just him and Danny were like the two first ones that were changed. My uh, second favorite moment still involved Mike. And it was after he had already been changed and he went back because he had, he had gone to Matt's house and died there. Right. And then there was this relatively tense scene when Matt called Ben and they had to figure out what to do with the dead body. And, you know, that whole thing got resolved. They took Mike in. They were going to do the autopsy on him, I guess. And then he like got up and left. And so if I'm remembering co- correctly, Matt was sitting with Susan in his house and he like heard something upstairs like a the window open and he like he like stopped susan while they were talking and he sort of went to go investigate Mm -hmm. and it in itself is not like a very creepy action but the way king wrote those couple pages like a lot of the book was creepy but didn't like unnerve me a lot but something about you know the way he wrote him hearing somebody upstairs really got to me and you know i haven't seen any of the either uh tv movie but this would be a scene if i was to shoot the movie that i would be super stoked to shoot just because you can really just pump in all this uncomfortableness and you know tension that there's something you know something's upstairs that shouldn't be there but you need to go figure it out it definitely allows for a lot of nonverbal communication in that sense because i'm sure it's just something you can see on his face. Obviously, we're reading it in a book, so we don't get to see that. But it sort of just came across that way, where you could almost perfectly visualize that moment and how it would feel for those characters. Yeah, it, exactly. That was one that I could, you know, I can put myself in his shoes a lot easier than I can put myself in, you know, Ben Mir's shoes trying to go stab a bunch of vampires with a stake. It, that one felt much more believable in the scope of you know the real world because you know everybody hears stuff creaking and moving around in the house right especially when you're in a town as old as jerusalem's lot it's bound to happen old houses creak there's no getting around it at all one of the other things i want to talk about before we discuss just how well the story has aged in general is the fact that they have a bit of a time jump in the epilogue you know they return a year later and ben just completely sets the place on fire what did you think of him waiting that long to come back he doesn't wait you know just a week or two to have things cool down a little bit he waits an entire year and then just destroys it all yeah i don't know i i had heard the rumor that king doesn't sort of end his stories really well Mm mm-hmm and I sort of thought the book would have been better suited to have ended like right after they kind of finish off Barlow. Okay. And just have them be like, because I, I think he says something like, you know, I'm going to come back for the rest of you later. And if the book kind of ended there, I think it would have ended on a high note to where you knew he was going to come back to do it, but you didn't necessarily have to see all of it. Yes. I think him taking so long was odd. But when you, I, I immediately went back and reread the opening, uh, chapter. So when when they just refer to him and him and Mark as like man, the man and the boy, uh, to sort of get sense of what they were going through after having known it, because that first part is so very vague, like almost painfully vague. And so when you go back and you reread that after knowing who they are and what they've been through, it made a lot more sense. And I definitely think it was odd that he took so long to go back i also think it was it didn't seem super efficient to me to just go down and burn down the whole town i don't i feel like there had to have been a easier better way but i mean i guess you just burn it down and leave and don't worry about it anymore we've seen him do this too where he sort of just wipes out an entire town because he does that with carrie after the incident in carrie the town is just completely deserted and this felt like it was going for the same sort of ending which i do agree with you i don't think 
this is something we necessarily needed. We would have been perfectly fine without this. I think it worked a lot better in Carrie because it was, you know, this big thing that happened. And in the same sort of sense, I don't want to spoil too much for you here because... No, it's okay. (laughs) In case you haven't gotten to that one just yet since you've only read a couple other than this one. But the town there, it wasn't as much of a character I would say, as Jerusalem's lot was here. So to just sort of destroy this town that had so much history to it, and that was such a big part of the story, it felt a little unnecessary to actually have him write that. I totally agree with you that we could have just left it off where I'm going to come back and finish you guys off. And that would have been a much more impactful ending, I think, than just burning everything down. Because there are only a few ways you can get rid of vampires. And he's not going to be able to stake everyone. So it's kind of a given what he's going to come back and do at some point. Right. It's definitely preference, like I mentioned earlier. It just depends on how people feel about these endings. And, you know, I haven't read close to everything that king has written so i still have a long ways to go to not quite as long as you but i still have a lot to get through so it'll be interesting to see you know throughout this podcast series how these endings affect people's opinions of the book and obviously with adaptations if they end it the same way you're going to have sort of that similar feeling but they have a little more leeway with how they end the adaptations because they could just cut out part of the book and it would be fine we know that book adaptations when they're turned into movies or tv shows they don't have every single detail in the books especially when you have books as long as stephen king books which right since you started with it you know (laughs) (laughs) you you, kind of started on the long side there (laughs) right yeah if i'm remembering correctly i think it kind of ends in a very similar way why the town's not totally destroyed it's just in a state of like complete chaos yeah, he likes um, ruining his towns, apparently. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, even going back to Barlow, the way they kind of, like, ended him kind of felt a little anticlimactic. Like, you kind of expected there to be more of a fight and more of some sort of grand standoff, but it's kind of like he just catches him sleeping and, you know, stakes him there. So I totally understand why people say his at least this book maybe don't necessarily end very strongly, but I, I kind of disagree. I, I like, like I said, I like when the stuff you don't expect to happen happens, you know, so that I, I was okay with it, but I, I totally understand how, how somebody could not have enjoyed it. And with the the version I read, I actually got this like weird sort of return of the King extended edition vibe with mine because okay. like, that the that ex- extended edition it feels like it ends like six times. It keeps you know <laughs> fading to black and go- and the way because I read the ebook version of it and it didn't tell me that it was starting the Jerusalem slot uh, short story or oh, that it was okay. starting the other short story that took place you know near near the lot. Yeah, one and for so the road, I, re- I believe. Yeah, and so I I think I read I think the very next thing that i read it just presented itself as a another chapter and it was the one for the road story so i was like oh like that's a kind of interesting story and i won't get into it if you guys are going to talk about it elsewhere but it was like all right that was an interesting ending and then i read the jerusalem slot short story after that and i was like what is like i feel like this should have ended like a hundred pages ago so i didn't realize that till i went and started doing a little more research on my own i didn't realize that i read this you know fancy version with all of that um you were probably like oh these chapters have names <laughs> right and then even after the jerusalem jerusalem's lot short story there was like 50 pages of deleted scenes oh where like, okay it was like just chunks of the book that he had either rewritten or changed or removed completely so that at that point i was like oh i there's probably something different about this book. So I went and did the research, but I read, you know, a handful of those just kind of, you know, quickly there was things about, I think Barlow's name was something else in the first draft. And I think uh, 
the way Jimmy Cody dies because in the book he like falls downstairs on a bunch of knives, right? Which seemed odd, like it that just seems sort of weird. And then in the lead, the deleted scene, he falls down and there's just like an a, amazing amount of rats and they just like eat him basically in this really kind of gruesome way. And it was like there's a little note that was from you know the editor suggested changing this from something to something a little less gruesome sort of thing. So it was interesting to sort of read bits and pieces of that book out of context, the way he sort of went about it the first time. But yeah, like I felt like that book ended four times because I read it in in such a weird order with those short stories. I can imagine you certainly got a lot more extra stuff than I did because I was reading a very old copy of the book. I am guessing that your copy, you said it was from 2004. I think that yeah, was when was... the mini series was remade. So oh, you probably that got that updated version when they were doing the one with, I, I believe it was Rob Lowe who started yeah. that one. And yeah. it, it'll be a while before we get to 2004 on this podcast. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll worry about that down the road here. So I think that's why you probably had a deleted scenes section so to speak too because yeah i'm sure there's some extra stuff that maybe was supposed to make it into the mini series and didn't or something like that too so that is definitely interesting but one other thing i want to ask you here is how well do you feel this story has aged because i think if this were to be written today i think you know susan would be a slightly different character at least just because absolutely there are a lot of dudes in the story yep. <laughs> and a lot of white dudes yes exactly and i mean granted it is maine i think there's typically a lot of white dudes in maine because i don't know who would move to maine really <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it definitely i think the biggest difference that would come from this book if it was sort of written today is the fact that Everybody knows and has a strong understand a strong. Everybody like knows about vampires, whether it's from, you know, True Blood or Twilight or any of these sort of like pop culture things that focus on vampires. I feel like everybody has an understanding and like an expectation of vampires that and I'm totally I don't know if this is true, but I'm assuming that it wasn't as prevalent back then. I think vampires were more of you know the pulp movies and sort of the old school vampire thing that you know the general public maybe didn't necessarily have a strong grasp on whereas now i think it's a bit different i feel like everybody has some sort of understanding and knowledge of what vampires do and how they act and all that stuff so i feel like that would have been a change and i, I definitely think you're right I, I this story is not does not have a lot of strong women characters i think maybe the strongest woman character outside of susan is the is eva the lady who runs the boarding house but even yes. her characters you know a little underwhelming in itself it's just a lot of you know guys coming in to save the day especially because susan you know gets turned really quickly i think you'd see a lot more uh uh strong female characters for sure Absolutely. I don't think it necessarily takes away from what this story is too much, though. When I was reading it, it's not like I was angry that there weren't a bunch of women that they were talking about in the story. Because, you know, when I'm going back and reading his books, I am taking into consideration, especially with the language in some of these books and everything that, you know, these were written in the 70s and 80s and everything like that. So there's going to be language in the any book book from that time period that wouldn't be used today pretty much that's sort of just a given and obviously we see that a ton with you know all these classic books that we're forced to read in high school and everything it's right. like you know a lot of those do not age well at all why are we still reading them <laughs> sort of thing but with these there's still a lot to enjoy with them at least in my opinion as someone who enjoys a lot of what Stephen King does whether it's you know books comics movie and tv shows and everything like that so i think you know it doesn't age super well but if you take into consideration the time period you're like okay i can see why this is something that really resonated with people and you know it sold 
so well as I, d- I don't know if he's had a bad selling book necessarily because people are still buying these books we're seeing them being reprinted constantly because of all the adaptations and i swear there's like 10 adaptations for stephen king things at any given time right i didn't realize because uh, i i started doing a little bit of research on him when i started reading this one i didn't realize that the carrie movie and the shining movie came so quickly after the books had come out i had yeah. assumed i had assumed that the books had been out a lot longer than the movies and like the books had already become this big thing but it's a lot more of like a book got popular and then the, somebody was oh let's make a movie off of this you know recently popular book i didn't realize that some of these things came so close together i i, I thought that was interesting yeah i certainly felt that felt that way too because i read carrie and i had rewatched the movie recently for this podcast and i was like oh you know those were only like two years apart right. so it was one of those things where i was like wow that was very quick considering the fact too that he threw carrie in the trash and his wife dug it out and was like you need to finish i didn't this. know that at all <laughs> huh. yeah it's he has little tidbits like that in some of his nonfiction books he has one called on writing and i highly recommend checking that out if you want something that isn't necessarily a fiction novel that you, that you want to read of his and right you know th- there's just quite a few little tidbits for things here and there like with Salem's Lot it was adapted into a radio drama in the UK which I find very interesting I'm tempted to try and go find that but it was in 1995 Hmm. so who knows if I'm going to be able to find that at all but that just sounds like something that you wouldn't necessarily expect but at the same time it isn't really surprising at all with a story like this yeah I I mean I I didn't realize like the you know the shining it was the same thing as carrie it was like it seemed like they were really close yeah and i assumed that it would there was a much bigger gap for people to sort of digest the novel and figure out you know i i don't know i just didn't realize it was that big and like you're saying there's a ton of i feel like there's been a resurgence in king adaptations lately between castle rock and it i feel like there's been a a big swell of it lately but that just might be me not knowing much about him and you know moving forward to to learn a bit more i just might be more perceptive to seeing him now it's one of those things where sometimes you have these really big adaptations but then you have adaptations of adaptations of adaptations and you're like why are there 10 children of the corn movies because they're literally i think there literally are like 10 at this point and part of it is you know stephen king lets students adapt his work So then sometimes those, you know, get picked up by some smaller distribution companies and everything like that. So they'll have IMDb pages, but you won't recognize a single name on them and things Mm -hmm. like that. So it's one of those things where he's very adaptation friendly in a sense. So, you know, he's probably not going to say no. And that's something else that I found out. I believe it was either in his on writing book or just through various interviews and articles that he's done over the years because you know i think if you're a film student you can give him like a dollar and adapt one of his stories or books so (laughs) you know it's it's definitely it's really cool a question of quality sometimes when it comes to hearing about adaptations and for the most part we are hearing about the big ones that right these giant studios are doing you know dr sleep is in the works right now and that is a sequel to The Shining, basically, which he wrote, I don't even know how many years later. But I didn't know that at all. More fun facts for you. And (laughs) it's it's just one of those things where, like you mentioned earlier, there are so many things tied together in the Stephen King universe that it is increasingly harder to keep track of them because you're like, okay, this character is here and here. And then, you know, Castle Rock, for instance, isn't based on one story it's based on a collection of stories that have mentioned the town and mentioned some of these characters and they're creating a whole new story with it so then you have those sort of things and you're like okay let me attempt to keep this straight but i probably won't and you know we mentioned obviously father callahan shows up later on in other stephen king work so you still have that as something that's happening this early on in his career so you know he sort of masterminded this from the start (laughs) yeah that's 
that's something that I always I I really like when you know creators kind of do that and keep everything in the shared universe whether it's something small like Tarantino having you know the the cigarette company and a bunch of his movies or you know whatnot I, I I like when creators sort of do that but yeah when I went down my Stephen King Wikipedia rabbit hole I just kept clicking links and I was like what <laughs> there's this thing and this you know yeah and what started that was a lot of the mythos and in, in like it going back and trying to read figure out what the heck I was reading and it's like oh there's this even bigger story behind this big story that the book had hinted at which you know you have you have to be a certain type of crazy to attempt all that but I enjoy it absolutely well I think that wraps it up for today here Andy thank you so much for coming on to talk about this i know you're still in your early days of diving into king but you are more than welcome to come back on and talk about anything else you read or watch down the line awesome i may do that uh as a king expert what should i read next should i just start from from the beginning and work my way down i have it shining and salem's lot done you know since we just talked about his second book. I would definitely recommend going back and just giving Carrie a quick read. It's actually not super long. Some of his early books were a little shorter. Carrie's a lot shorter than it. I can tell you that right now. Yeah. <laughs> so that would definitely be my recommendation because I think you'll sort of get a feel for where he started from with that one. And then, you know, as you read other books down the line, you'll be like, okay, he started with Carrie and went to this. And I think it'll just be nice to sort of have that for reference, just to have read his first published book. Right. Okay. I will do that. Awesome. Uh, thank you again. And to our listeners, as always, thank you all for listening, and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.